So welcome back everyone to the second panel of China Between Worlds. And this is perhaps the crux or the most, one of the most special parts of this conference uh, in which we'll be hearing directly from members of the Shanghai American School uh, who were attended before 1949 and 1950. Uh, one of them, uh, Eva Jolovitz, was unable to make it in person today, but she is up there on the screen and uh, uh, will be speaking to us in a moment. Uh, and uh, I'm sure you will enjoy her talk. Uh, but uh, in the meantime, I would like to introduce Mimi Hollister Gardner, who will introduce our speakers for today. So please give her a warm round of applause. Thank you. I'm really not going to say much about the individuals because as we speak, we'll be introducing ourselves, really. And I think we're going to start with Reva, uh, just because she's Skyped in, and that would be a good way to start this off. So, Reva, tell us about yourself and what you want to say. Hello, everybody. I'm you. <laughs> See you right here. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I thank you very I thank you. I thank you so very much. Wonderful University of Michigan for hosting this extraordinary event. To my dear friend and neighbor, Shika Hefton, who said, you can sit on the phone. Joe agreed by telephone, and Shika worked it out. Nothing should have magic and turn science. This chance for which I am very grateful. Both sets of correct hair came from work job. My return to Bangkok went to Harbin to fight in the Southern Japanese school of Nazi thought. Wow, a wonderful place to know what to do with Nazi thought. Back to Russia, this family to Harbin. Mother was born here. Father was born in Russia, but when he was four, his family also flew him. They went to Shanghai. When mother found they moved to Shanghai and met and married. I was born in Hong and later my sister moved to Shanghai. So I really grew up. The Japanese made their presence felt more and more. In 1937, we were evacuated to Hong Kong to the British government for three months and took things quietly down. We never really did. Back to Shetland, which had an international section that was not occupied. But Shanghai was bustling, booming for the race course, ballet school that I went to. Uh, Theaters, music, great restaurant, Sanya, the chocolate shop, the fishing, grocery, where I was led to believe that strange stacks of pumpkins, American stock. Also, beggars everywhere. Beggars everywhere. Babies lost in the street. Opium pipes. Great mixtures of nationalities, socially and geographically, and refugees coming in as things built up and up and up before the World War. I began my education at the people who school for girls, an English school on Avenue Bacon. Having quit school at age 14 to support his parents, my father made a book of correspondent course in accounting from the U.S. and after straight jobs taking him around China and Korea, he got an accounting job with the Texas Oil in Shanghai. Meanwhile, the Japanese presence was growing more and more menacing, such that when he was transferred to Manila in October of 1941, he begged on to take Helen to meet America. She refused, thank God. Instead, she, my sister and I arrived in Manila on December the 7th, 1941. Incidentally, that's the 15th anniversary. 
After a period, head is coming. The Japanese took Mitra on February the 3rd, and on the 4th, we were interned at Santa Tomas, a university founded 1611 by Dominican priests. It became known as STIC, Santa Tomas Internment Camp. About 3,900, quote, enemy agents, and liberated on February 3rd, 1945. My family had become British subjects. I was already British by birth. What a world state was. Three and a half years, our world, in which life went up in women, children, but on an increasingly upside down terms. Former managers of big business became garbage duty managers and directors of every kind. Educated, set up an incredible system. Former managers of American system, they said to me, you're 10, you go in the fifth grade. Despite mounting difficult physical conditions and mental paucity of books, although the university provided many, disease of every kind, huge rainy seasons that obliviated some schooling spaces, mounting starvation, bombings, threat of extinction, starvation, and finally no school at all, as I recall, from December 44 till June of 45, when I walked into Oakland High School, California, with a spectacular letter from camp educators that put me into the remaining two to three weeks of eighth grade, as though nothing adverse ever happened. Our rescue suicide mission, the war continued in Manila, even after our operation. I think Manila was the second first bomb city next to Warsaw during the war. Um, but, uh, and then, to top it all off, while we were still in the camp, shortly after liberation, my sister was run over. She was five years old, little in a red dress, and run over by an army truck. Thank God he didn't kill her, but she was in the army hospital, which did a miraculous, uh, which helped her, and you we were able to leave in April on a destroyer convoy that was so slow. We had a destroyer escort. The sailor on the, on the escort, the speeder caught the depth chart, the ship we were torpedoed, but not hit. And anyway, we got to San Francisco, and I remember the shock of seeing buildings cold and restaurant where we would, I was tempted to leave, eat what was left over from the tables, but they gave me funny looks. <laughs> I thought I went back to Shanghai right out the war. After two years in San Francisco, we followed him. And here comes the American school. Since our first reunion here in Virginia, on which I worked with Susan Dorf and May she rest in peace, what a lovely person. We've been meeting, having get it, getting together, sharing such wonderful memories of friends, teachers, uh, and Susan and I had a lot of fun in our French class at Dr. Schwartz. Remember? Thoughts of college. My father and I would pick up in Walsh's bookstore in Shanghai and brought for a dollar about Joyce Five Colleges. They were going to be in China, so they didn't really want me to go to Berkeley, but we had relatives in California, because they thought Berkeley was too big. But then we saw Stanford, that Love Joyce Five, and said, Oh, that looks nice. We were so naive. Never a thought that the decision was not all ours. Anyhow, I took a 10th grade Stanford test, luckily, because that's about all I had. Miraculous part, because in January of our senior year at SAS, we had to leave and could get into uh, the United States because our woman and I not have the citizenship. So we found ourselves in Vancouver, Canada. My first kid, I had to tell teachers at King Edward High, 
that I had to have college recommendations. I couldn't even wait for Mrs. Merritt's grade on my last English paper. Someone must have felt sorry for me, and I made it to Stanford. Then I went to Columbia Masters. I taught English, met my husband, Herb, my husband, Timothy. He's from Canton, Ohio, and I'm from Canton. I thought that was a <laughs> followed him to Washington, where he first worked with the Secretary, and we've been here ever since. Many other jobs, a son called the Jenna, now a deep granddaughter of 12 in Europe. I so enjoyed our 1990 reunion in China, and even more the one with her eight years later when we went up down to Yangtze and Perth, saw all the wonderful things. And Wonderful get gets with other students. Different political circumstances, physical changes, but still roots and coincidence. You should have seen that students react when I went into Whitman High School, our neighborhood school here in Bethesda, and uh, to Mrs. Croft's math class. And I told how lucky they were to have her because. She was my teacher, and she helped make our school because we were interned together at Santa Claus. And about a year ago, my husband and I opened a new account in a, in a new bank here in Bethesda. Very nice lady with us. She's from Afghanistan. And I told her that a boy whose father was ambassador came to our Shanghai Medical School. But suddenly I couldn't remember his name. I left the room for him when Lenny came to me. Why did the towers you? She almost fainted. She called her husband right here to tell him I knew his cousin. The man was Tarzi's cousin. She told us that Tarzi had married, had children, and had been living in Switzerland, but that he had died a year before from cancer. So you never know. Here's to the Shanghai American School, to the University of Michigan, to China, to America, to the world, to us. Thank you. Church, 
on Kulan Su Island, part of the city of Xiamen in Fujian province in 1933. Among my earliest recollections are fire balloons launched at festival time with firecrackers, which I could see from my iron bed painted with cream-colored enamel, which I teased down. Another memory is that of a summer stay in 1937 on the mountain named Kulian, outside of Fujo. I can even now smell the scent of the pines in the rain and hear the intimidating roar of thunderstorms rushing up the mountainside. And I remember a visit to Qingdao in the spring of 1941 that revealed German influences although the city was lately controlled by the Japanese army. The latter were actively engaged in a public health campaign, giving compulsory small, smallpox inoculations to passers-by on the city street corners. Later, our family was stationed upriver from Xiamen at a rural town surrounded by fields of tobacco and peanuts and the ubiquitous rice paddies. I amused myself by capturing very colored a clutch of dragonflies and watching kingfishers dive for their food in the river. We could watch a herd of water buffaloes coming up from their sulk in the eddies and see the blood and gorge leeches drop from their flanks. My father escorted us about two kilometers down the main road to view the sugar mill in action were two enormous grindstones turned by, turned by a team of oxen, shredded sugarcane while the juice was caught by workmen. Ominously, a Japanese patrol plane flew an inspection sortie up the river course every other day or so. Soon we were summoned back to the mission base, Kulan Tzu, or Kulan Ju, with transportation by riverboat, by bus, and by motor launch. Perhaps the Japanese attack was only a half surprise to us on December 8th. Their army had controlled the port for years, and their navy had practiced undisguised maneuvers in the harbor for many, many months. Nevertheless, we woke that day to witness the Japanese flag flying over our mission school and a fully armed sentry posted in the yard below our window. My father had gone upriver to attend to church business and found himself prevented from returning to Kulanju. And we didn't see him again until March 1946. So consequently, my mother marched herself and us three children, my sister Marjorie, myself and my brother John, down to the Japanese hospital where we were listed as alien non-combatants and sent home, warned to stay on our mission grounds. Came April 14, 1942. We were rounded up to board the Sunshan Maru, we call the Sunshine Maru, <laughs> ironically, sailing for Shanghai. The stormy voyage took one week, and during our quarantine, the Japanese insisted on subjecting all passengers to a humiliating glass rod inserted up the bare backside and secured in a long test tube ostensibly to check for disease. Of course, we never learned the results. We were billeted at the American school on Avenue Pitan. Children's classes were held at the community school across the road, and then abruptly, we were transferred to the Columbia Country Club, which had not been maintained since the onset of the war. But we were allowed freedom to travel on the roads. On short notice, we were trundled onto buses the morning of June 30th and put aboard the Italian vessel Ponte Verde. Anchored in the Huangpu River and ready to sail for an unnamed destination with a full list of assembled civilian war captives. 
A few days after embarkation, we rendezvoused with the Japanese liner Asama Maru. Like ourselves, bound for the waters off Singapore on July 4. Then it was on to Lorenzo Marquez, in Mozambique, from the Indian Ocean to the South Atlantic, in zigzag style, <coughs> and we hailed Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. At last, we steamed into New York Harbor on August 25, 1942, and people on deck cried without shame when we passed the Statue of Liberty. We resided in Grand Rapids, Michigan until my father returned. Then both parents were assigned to study Mandarin at the Yale Language School. While I became acquainted with freshman year at the Milford Public School. We returned to China in September 1947, and I enrolled as a sophomore at SAS to be taught by an incomparable staff of instructors and surrounded by an energetic assemblage of young fellow students, male and female, some of whom you see here today. <coughs> I never completed my junior year. The U.S. Consular authorities sent us down to the Hong Q Pier on April 29, 1949, just after an unforgettable, unforgettable trip to Hangzhou during our spring break, an excursion arranged by Dr. Lewis and his family. Harry Lewis, who is in attendance at this conference, can attest to this glorious adventure to the city favored by Confucius himself. From the pier, we pushed down the Huangpu in a landing craft to the Yangtze River, where a gleaming white ship lay anchored. It was the United States naval ship Repose, a naval hospital ship dispatched to care for British military personnel wounded in a point-blank shootout between the HMS Amethyst versus Red Army gunners, who had effectively drawn a line in the waters. We students were bumped in space on the U.S. vessel and deposited at Hong Kong to be claimed by our mission representatives. There ensued a long summer for me and my family up country Fujian, while my parents wrestled with the question of where I should complete high school. At last it was decided that my brother and I should visit Hong Kong, board the French liner La Marseillaise, bound for Manila with plans to enter the Brent School in Baguio. Let me say this about the Shanghai American School as I experienced it. The buildings and campus were modeled on Eastern American boarding and prep schools and designed to serve the children of U.S. business, military, and missionary kids. Also admitted were Chinese, German, and Canadian pupils. Dormitory rooms allowed the housing of one or two students each. And there was a spacious dining hall with two gymnasiums with facilities for football, basketball, track and field, soccer, tennis, and boxing. The administration building featured school offices and classrooms, as well as a wood shop and an auditorium. The prevailing intellectual atmosphere was liberal, tolerant, yet with firm moral and sexual attitudes. Faculty members were experienced teachers who cared about students and respected the traditions and culture of the campus. About China, there is an understandable disparity between metropolitan China and the villages in the countryside. Xiamen, Hong Kong, Shanghai, all exhibited the organizing influences of foreign interests. By and large, they were crowded, noisy, active, and socially diversified. Small businesses stood cheap by jowl with large manufacturers. Rural China was dedicated to agriculture, with small town and homespun attitudes. 
networks of family and friends seem to dominate the rural society. Sorry. dominate the rural society with notable overshadowing by the military, whether national troops or freelance bandit chiefs. In summary, my feelings. Anyone who has visited the National Museum in Shanghai must be struck by the awesome reach of the Chinese culture from ancient days. One can conclude that China very much is very much like its symbol, the tiger. The animal is electric, stunning. As a kid, it is cunning. We love to hold it close, forgetting to note its large and puissant paws. When it matures as a grown pet, we must be wary of the danger it poses as a predator pet that wounds without hesitation or remorse. Yet we adore the tiger for its transcendent beauty, for its arresting form when in motion. But in tranquility, it reflects many of the qualities that the Chinese themselves cultivate. Intelligence, creativity, loyalty to its clan, power under control, grace, and one would like to add, humility. Thank you. And she 
elected to have a baby there. She must have been nuts. Okay. I'm delighted to be here. I, this is the third time I've gone to an SAS reunion and I learned something every time from each of these speakers. I can relate to what they did. I'll tell you just one quick story. It, is it universe, it relates to what Reva had to say. We're in Ann Arbor here. I've been in Ann Arbor once before. I had a girlfriend here. <laughs> and she wanted to know what my intentions were. Well, I'd never thought about any intentions before because the Korean War was on and I didn't want to have somebody uh, after me when I might be brought home in a box. So I didn't get very far there. But if we had one standard oil representative, his name was Pete Dorrance. He was from Coldwater, Michigan, went to the University of Michigan, I think he was a football player. But his grandson is a fellow named Anson Dorrance. Anson Dorrance may not be a household name, but down in North Carolina where we live now, He's pretty well known because he's the coach of the North Carolina girls soccer team, among whom was some girl named Mia Hamm. And they won the world championship in China. And he is the winningest coach of any sport in history just about. He's won 16 national championships. So that's why I'm delighted to be here. <laughs> anyway, uh, I, I learn a lot from here. Uh, I meet new friends every time I come, and I, that, that's a real benefit. The second thing was, uh, uh, my career was in, was in business. I, first, I wanted to be in the Foreign Service because my heroes were Jack Service. He's, he's a Citroenese, just like me. And Jim Lilly. Jim Lilly, father, was a Standard Oil. And he did pretty well in the Foreign Service and Ambassador to China and other Ambassador to Korea. I think most of you are familiar with some of the things he did. <clears throat> and then I didn't have anything to do with China, but in 1993 I retired and I said, gee, I want to get back and see my birthplace. And then I read in the China Connection that uh, General Stilwell's daughter was going to lead a group to China, so I, I got a hold of her and she, she said, come along. And so I went to uh, the opening of the Stillwell Museum in Chongqing. Have you been there? I've never been there before. So before 1997, Chongqing belongs to Sichuan. Yes, that's right. I, I know you're right. Yeah, I'm from Sichuan, actually. So, but Chongqing was part of Sichuan at that time. Okay. Well, it was quite an event. You know, Chiang Kai-shek was our hero. Henry Liu saw to that. All I read was Life magazine, and boy, everything was saying the heroic Chinese and everything. This. This meeting was a little bit different. Uh, Chiang Kai-shek wasn't portrayed as much of a hero. We had plays and everything. And what a, a terrible person. <laughs> well, obviously, you're, you're in communist China. They, they didn't remember him like Henry Luce did. And, uh, I was there, I met members
members of the, of the Dix mission, uh, I was given a book about that mission. That was quite a mission. Those people really hit it off together. Uh, and uh, I pretty well sold that we might have done something a little bit different in China. But anyway, and I went back in 2000, in, in, in 2011, and everything had changed. Uh, the, the, my picture was taken out of the museum. My father, who was in charge of the, all the fuel over the hump, during what they took them back in the Air Force, and, 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 they, and we donated the drum there. All the all the all the displays were, were taken down because of the bombing in Belgrade. What was quite an incident. The, the students had ransacked the place. So much for that. I want the final thing I want to talk about is. Standard Oil in China. Standard Oil in China was a mission. Our mission was to bring light to the Chinese. And every time people say, you were born in China, were your parents missionaries? I say, well, kind of. <laughs> anyway, they, they, uh, I'm just going to conclude by showing you a couple of pictures that I brought along. <coughs> this is one of the hills where, where I was born. Yeah, you can pass it around. I've got another copy. This is Huang Shan. That's the next hill over. That's where. Chiang Kai-shek had his headquarters in, in, when, when he wanted to escape the bomb. It's way up 2,000 steps or so. This is a picture of the Mei Fu Lang. Mei Fu means beautiful and trustworthy. And Standard Oil was pretty much that way. They had very good people. They were all compatible. Most a lot of them were from Cornell or Princeton or oh, oh, they recruited quality people. It was very hard to get a job with them. These were the things that I donated to the museum, and my pic my pictures in there. And. Uh, I would, that, that's, that's about all I want to cover today. Thank you very much for inviting me. Before Carl speaks, I'm, I'm going to talk Carl for a minute, okay? Uh, I just wanted to tell you a little about our family experience, too. Um, I grew up in Fujian province. Um, my grandmother went to China in 1884, and my father was the youngest of seven children who was uh, born there, and China was always home to him. Uh, he, be, he came to the States to be educated at Ohio Wesleyan and Boston University Medical School, and then went back uh, in the 1930s. As soon as he was out of medical school and did his residency in Hawaii, uh, off he went back to China. During, this was in the Depression years. Um, we were homeschooled, of course, as, as missionary kids most were in the early years. Um, and I, was, I just wanted to skip through some of the things that, especially from the previous talks, uh, were of interest to me. In 1940, 
Uh, the Japanese occupied Fuzhou, where we were, and there were soldiers at the compound gate where we lived. And, uh, you know, we kids would go up to the gate and talk to them and be friendly with them. And in that accommodation that Joe talked about between missionaries and the Japanese occupying uh, guards, uh, in order to carry on with their work. At that time, my dad, our, our car had an American flag painted on the top of it because there were these Japanese sorties into the area by air. And uh, this kept him safe. And so he uh, could drive to the hospital from where we lived. And then, of course, after Pearl Harbor, and at that point, the Japanese had pulled away from the South some of the occupying parts. And so they were no longer in Fuzhou when, when Pearl Harbor happened. So then, of course, he blacked out the American flag on the car uh, in order to continue to go to work. And, and soon, we moved up country. We were never interned during the war. We moved up the Min River to a little hospital where uh, Priscilla and I were born, actually. And he continued to operate there and then Later, we got out of China by various means and across the Pacific during the war in 1944. Um, some of the, and also the, when, when you talked about, I think it was you, Dr. Bright, that talked about the, um, the kind of haven that SAS was in, uh, in the fashion of the time that we were an island in China, a very American island in China. As a teenager, I was way more interested in, you know, my friends and in boys and stuff than I was in what was going on around us in the rest of China. So that part was very much an isolation there. Um, I remember one time going home on holiday and my dad talking about uh, some university students coming to visit him. And they wanted to talk about the fact that the Guomindan government was so corrupt and the communist government seemed like it had so much more to offer China. And my dad, being politically a socialist, uh, was very attentive to what they were saying and he felt socialism was much more Christian than capitalism. Um, so it was, it was just an interesting thing that I, I remember that conversation and, and it stayed with me. And so he was very much in sympathy initially and was so upset when, as the government, the communist government proceeded, there were so many killings and so much torture and so much isolation of so many people uh, and the, the cultural revolution was so disappointing to him because he really thought this was going to be a whole new era that would be so good for China. Uh, another thing that struck me was um, the progressiveness of your grandfather and his understanding of, of what the church should be about. And my dad, when after, after China closed up, he was uh, the director of Methodist medical missions around the world. And in New York, in the God Box, you know, 475 Riverside Drive, as so many of our parents were, you know, connected to, and and one of his uh, uh, agreements in order to take that job was that he would spend half his time in our mission hospitals around the world because he knew what it was like to be under the dictate of the God Box, most of whom had not been to China had a clue really what was needed there. And so he insisted that he wanted that very personal connection with the medical missions around the world. Um, he was interned, when we left China in 1949, he stayed on for a year in order to uh, be sure that the hospital got turned over to medical people and was never left without medical attention. And um, he wrote some letters, he wrote, wrote a report that I found that uh, paints an interesting picture, and I'm going to quote from it. Um, he stayed on for until, 
Well, August 1949 was when our part of China was liberated. And um, when he was ready to leave China, he had to post his intention in the newspaper for several months in case he owed debts to anybody they could collect. And Grammy uh, was still in Putin, which is down, down near the coast from Fuzhou. And she really intended to live out her life there. The Chinese had built a home for her. But then it became too dangerous for the Chinese for her to stay. And so she left, uh, when my, left with my father. And this is what he wrote on leaving. Um, the new communist government is keenly interested in medical and public health work. The director of the Fujian Provincial Lab for Making Vaccines, who kept his job under the new regime, says that the communist government is more cooperative and more willing to provide the funds for supporting the work than the Guomindang, which was so riddled with graft and corruption that there was little money left for doing the work. Christian hospitals have today had very little interference with our work. Our most serious problem is finance. Formerly, Union Hospital was 85% self-supporting from income, private rooms, drug sales, operation, and x-ray fees, etc. All of these are down. Rich people have run away, become poor, or dare not let it be known that they have money poor are poorer than ever because of high taxes, unemployment, inflation. We were forced to cut salaries to 60% of what they were. All hospitals are similarly affected. It's difficult to cut staff. Everyone wants to stay. Morale is good. People want to work in the Christian hospital rather than the government ones or have private practice. And then he finishes with, the great tragedy of our age is the split of the world into two camps, the Soviet Union and its satellites versus the US and what we call the free world. Our greatest weakness is that we have nothing positive in our approach to the problem. We simply are opposed to the communists and whatever they are for, we are against them. <coughs> War will not solve the problem whether it is a cold war or a shooting war. We can only solve it by making our enemies into our friends. Why did China go communist? One, crumbling of old warlords and seeking for a new government, something quick, positive, adaptable to China. Two, it caught the imagination of a few leaders who built it up. They were driven underground for a while but their dedication and mission illustrates the futility of fighting ideas with force. And three, the corruption of the Guomindang is selfishness. General Jiang admits it, denounces it, but he was powerless to stop it. In 1950, when this was written, he says, communists were honest and free from corruption, were self-sacrificing, had given up money to live very simply and frugally, Christian virtues. So that was my dad's assessment at the time. Uh, the one other thing that he did that was alluded to, um, he, uh, when he got that job in New York, he wrote a paper about the importance of the American mission headquarters no longer ru ruling the roost and turning over the work to, in this case, the Chinese. Uh, indigenous leaders, the, the, uh, the ministers and the heads of seminaries and colleges and just the whole idea of, again, he really supported that and insisted, tried to educate the American hierarchy in uh, making that happen. So, that's it. Thank you.
want to I want to thank particularly the speakers uh, from the University of Michigan uh, for setting uh, so clearly and so concisely uh, the dramatic and significant elements uh, uh, of the political context in which we live. Uh, I'm going to be uh, presenting uh, <clears throat> essentially a, uh, a series of perhaps snapshots of a life in a missionary family, uh, uh, very much on the ground, way down on the ground. Um, it, I, I'm saying snapshots, not stories, because uh, those could go on forever, and we've heard some wonderful stories already, but uh, if any of you don't know it and are interested in a book on life in a missionary in China, I recommend, of course, my mother's book, which is called The, Ch the Chinese Ginger Jars, it was Harvard Rose religious bestseller, sold 60,000 copies in 1960. Myra with Chinese ginger jars, and it's got a lot of good stories in it. Um, so, I suppose it all began with my father. Uh, as a boy, he had heard somewhere, uh, perhaps from some mission recruiter, that impoverished peoples who lived thousands of miles away from Cortland, New York, were dying for lack of medical care. At that point in his very young life, whenever and however it came to him, he heard the call to become a medical missionary. And he answered that call. There followed college, medical school, and a residency at a hospital where he met our mother, a nurse. On their second date, he told her of his plans to live and work overseas. Our mother, whom my Jim and I used to say, spent her whole life leaving Mechanicville, New York, decided that this was the husband she was not going to let get away. Within a year, they married each other, and together they thus married adventure. In the fall of 1930, with a four-month-old uh, baby, our brother Jim, they took a ship from China, a country then ruled by warlords, uh, already divided politically and threatened by the Japanese army uh, by then in Manchuria. Our parents spent their first year in Beijing studying spoken and written Mandarin. Dad worked afternoons at the Peking University Hospital. In 1931, they went to Jinan, a small city in southwest Shandong at the end of a railway line. They took charge of a 32-bed hospital housed in a long brick building with a dirt floor and oil paper windows, a woman's ward at one end and a men's ward at the other. Our father became the hospital's CEO, CFO, sole internist, and occasional lab technician, plumber, and general repairman. He saw ward patients in the morning and ran a triage clinic all afternoon. I often wondered how he managed uh, making these series of decisions with each patient, which one he would send home with nothing, which he sent home with some kind of medication, which he put them on the reserve list for a hospital bed, and those which were in such crucial condition that they got the first bed that was available. Um, he had a wonderfully calm and methodical way of dealing with people. Our mother trained and supervised the nursing staff when she wasn't uh, having babies, running the household, and teaching the older offspring. Despite their commitment to this demanding work, our parents gave us a safe and interesting home. Our mother homeschooled all six of us through seventh grade, never went to college, never needed to. Daily at noon, our father came home for the midday meal, and while our parents discussed their work, we offspring listened and learned quite a bit about illness, hospitals, treatments, and life itself <coughs> in China. Our parents made sure we had books of all sorts, as well as 78 recordings of classical music and 1920 dance tunes my brother and I remember guarding the back and front doors while my, our parents rolled up the rug in the living room and danced as they used to when they were courting. Uh, 
we were to roll the rug out quickly in case other missionaries showed up. <laughs> Homeschool ended at 1 p.m. in the day, so after lunch, we were free to read, draw, play, nap, watch the passing drama on Paifong Street, or go to our grandmother's house for molasses cookies and stories by Dickens, Osa Johnson, and Bell Bentley. Our mother read to us at the end of each day's class, and our father read to us at bedtime. I remember Winnie the Pooh and Uncle Wiggly stories, and only when I read that particular point in one of the Winnie the Pooh stories where my father would break into laughter, I remembered why we never caught the irony. We children were well read to. We lived in a compound, a walled community of American missionaries and some Chinese staff. A complete mission station in China had a school, a church, and a hospital. Thus, our American neighbors were two single women who ran the school um, and three ministers who did the evangelism in the countryside. The local church was already had a Chinese pastor. Our servants also lived in the compound. Without telephone, refrigerator, modern stove, central heating, washing machine, automobile, in fact, destitute of virtually all technology, we relied completely on our servants in order to exist uh, and for our parents to work in Jeannie. Therefore, we children were taught to respect and obey our servants. We also learned to love them. But none, we loved none so much as we loved our nannies, our amas. They so loved and cared for us that they were probably closer to us than our own mothers. Uh, I ran across recently a poem by mother, uh, by our mother, referring to a pockmarked woman who was more a mother to us than I could be myself. Uh, what a poignant thing for a woman who was uh, burdened with all kinds of administrative nursing uh, a step, uh, problem of being the peacemaker in the compound and, of course, uh, running the nursing staff of the hospital. By 1937, the storm presaged by the gathering war clouds in the north broke over our city. On January 7, 37, we heard the sounds of bombs and shells falling in the northern suburbs of Jinan. Later that day, while I was uh, constructing a tower of blocks, in Jim's and my bedroom, a huge explosion shook the house, shattered the glass in the windows, and toppled my tower of blocks, even as the event was toppling the old order in eastern China. After two days of fighting, the Japanese army took control of our city. The flags of the rising sun appeared everywhere. Guards were posted at the gates of the central city and the doors of major institutions, including our father's hospital, were uh, guarded by Japanese soldiers. On passing the gates into the city or entering the hospital, we had to bow quite low to the guard, thus acknowledging the power and the authority of our invaders. I remember so clearly, though I was a child, the shame, the fear, and the fury that I felt as a child as we bowed to these invaders. Six months later, a drunk soldier wounded our father and would have killed him with a shot to the head had not the gun jammed. I remember we three children walking into the hospital and seeing our father on the bed, the sheets stained with blood, his uh, face <coughs> as white as the pillow um, where his head lay but he recovered. This incident, but even more, the manifest and consistent daily cruelty and contempt which Japanese soldiers routinely showed their Chinese subjects, including our servants. I remember them kicking the gateman all the way up to the front steps when they, when they came to see us, left us with a sense of apprehension and resentment which uh, even now I find occasionally surfaces. And it, I think of how Afghan and uh, other uh, children may feel about American soldiers 
uh, I fear that with them too, this will be a lifetime heresy. That too becomes part of a political scene. For the next seven years, uh, a foreign army ruled our world and our lives. During this time, the depth of our parents' dedication became apparent. For in the summer of 1940, our parents received a letter from the head of the China mission warning of the possibility of war between the United States and Japan and instructing mothers and children to return to the United States. Our parents, knowing perfectly well by then the dangers of living under the Japanese army, replied that since they were still able to do the work for which they came to China, they would remain. I also read the letter of the head of the mission uh, in response to that. He was not very happy. Therefore, it was the, uh, thus the case on December 7th, 1941, that our family was placed under house and yard arrest, except that our parents were allowed to go to the hospital to work. In 1942, in the middle of the summer, they were offered the chance to return to the States on the first prisoner exchange. But they again elected to remain in Jinning. Why? Because they could still work in the hospital. It was a no-brainer for them. But even uh, only after 15 months of house arrest and six months in the Weishin internment camp did they accept the offer to return to the United States on a second prisoner exchange. But even though, though we children did not know it at the time, they wisely did not tell us a lot of things, now, they had already decided they would stay in camp if our father was not on the exchange. The family was not to be broken up. After the war, our family returned to China to a new mission station in Jiangsu, north of Shanghai. At this time, my brother and I attended uh, SAS, and I'm uh, grateful to David Angus for describing uh, some of the circumstances of that school. The one thing, uh, uh, one of the, the one course I remember best was taking with Mr. Wu uh, Chinese language, uh, written language, and I still to this day uh, doodle around with Chinese characters. Uh, and why? Because it's a way of reconnecting. It is, it's not simply the elegance and the interestingness of these characters, but it is, it is being back there again. Uh, I'm not talking about what China meant to me because that's too huge and it would be impious to try to refer to it now, but it's part of my life forever. One of the one, most wonderful things that happened was when our youngest, having uh, started an Asian major uh, at the co in college, went and spent a year uh, studying at Nam Da. And we went back on our first China, took the whole family and went back. And I remember walking through the streets of Nanjing at 1 p.m. in the morning. And her daughter, her daughter saying to me, I don't want to go back. And I just knew how strongly she felt that because I could remember that feeling. I really didn't want to go back. During those brief years, we children were doing something we, we didn't understand. We were creating a, a community of our own. We didn't know it. Through sports, dances, datings, school clubs, a school newspaper, off-campus forays to theaters, ice cream parlors, restaurants, markets, occasionally in places which our parents probably would not have wanted us. We were discovering ourselves. We were creating bonds of which we were then, I think, unconscious. Shot to the four winds after graduation, or after the 1949 closure of the school, we were plunged into colleges, jobs, spouses, offspring, and the bewildering world of the fast-changing West. We had really no immediate or practical reason to reconnect with each other. But we began in time to realize, as time passed, that we were not like other Americans. 
that this apparent homeland was in no way our home. We felt a strange dis-ease that sent us searching for each other. And when we found each other, we began to discover who we had been to each other at SAS, and who we were still to each other. This legacy, this sense, has continued with us for almost 50 years, and here we are, in Ann Arbor in 2017, a remnant, to be sure, for our 10th and likely last stateside general reunion. At these reunions, I have been interested in to perceive the impact of missionary living on fellow missionary offspring. And it has a twofold effect. For many, it has created, and not surprisingly to me, a certain bitterness about what was missed, about the pain of reconnecting with a country where you're never quite part of, of the impact of the parents' idealism and their overwork, the tremendous pressures placed on our parents mm -hmm. that made them unable to deal with a number of issues uh, which we, as children, quite naturally had. Um, I have felt all of these. Um, I think I was probably the first person in our family tree to go see a psychiatrist, and I remember how, how nervous my parents were uh, about this prospect for, for what, what it might come out to sort of smash the family legend. Well, all family legends were made to be smashed, and um, it, I thought it was a pretty good thing. But I think I want to say something, uh, one more thing about our childhood, that, and this is the last thing I said. I said that our parents gave us one thing more. They passed on to us their faith, their trust in God, and their sense of allegiance to the loyalty of Jesus, to Jesus, of Jesus. And this, I think, has guided us through many crises and deprivations and has been essential, an essential part of our identity. It is for this reason that all six of us are deeply involved in churches, despite the dysfunction that we all know that all churches have. The legacy of our parents' faith is their greatest gift to us. And to think it all began 90 years ago with two people who wanted something a lot more than comfort and security, and thus embarked on the finest adventure that one could hope for, at least on this side of the Jordan. Thank you. <laughs>
and from there uh, we we took a train to Bombay and stayed in a Methodist guest house where my aunt and uncle were, were running the guest house. It was my father's sister who was running the guest house. And we were fortunate that we were able to uh, get a the, the Mariposa ship that had been a luxury liner transformed into a troop carrier. And we weren't in India very long. Some people had been there for months waiting for a ship out. So we sailed from Bombay, and um, the ship only had fresh water in port. The rest was salt water for washing. Served two meals a day because the, the mess was running 24 <coughs> hours a day. Um, we got into bed bugs and so had to be fumigated. We had some, Ita I think it was Italian prisoners of war on the ship who we offloaded in Melbourne, Australia. We sailing through the Indian Ocean, we were escorted by um, the, destroyer and the destroyer escort that I found out later sank the submarine. And from Melbourne, we sailed across the Pacific through the Panama Canal up to Boston, which was where we were headed, <coughs> our family, and my mother was from that area. And we had to be fumigated again before we could get off the ship. <laughs> Is Reba listening to us now? I'm sorry to say. Is Reba listening to us now? Yes. Yeah. And so we need to thank Reba and say we're glad to see you and we give you good wishes. Did <laughs> you hear us, Reba? Yeah, she's probably up to be at the mic. Reba, you got caught. Reba, thank you. We, we uh, I think. Uh, Scoville said that we wanted to send you lots of love and good wishes, and we wish you were here. So, thank you. I'm glad to all together. Yeah, good. Uh, yes. Jim? Yes, Jim. Um, thank you, Carol, for reading my prepared speech. <laughs> <laughs> There's been a lot said about the Japanese occupation troops in China, and in fairness to the Japanese, I think there are a couple of things that were not mentioned. Uh, they were exceptionally cruel, but they were brought up under a regime which was brutal. Uh, there was a lot of beating in the Chinese and the Japanese army, and uh, the bowing, when we, which was ignominious to us at the time, going through the gate in. in uh, I didn't realize until later was part of Japanese courtesy of bowing to each other and to itself. These are the things you learn later. The main thing, though, was that uh, there was a couple of stories of the Japanese uh, Japanese soldiers who come back to me, and uh, Carl and I were talking about this once. Uh, in 1942, we were put under house arrest uh, after Pearl Harbor. And at that time, the Japanese authorities insisted on having at least uh, on having uh, Japanese troops within the missionary compound and in our house. So they moved two Japanese soldiers into our house, and they took over permanent residence in what was Dad's study. And they were there for, from sometime in 1942 until we moved to Asia. When Mom went back into that one room, not one single article had been moved. Everything on Dad's up, up desk had been stayed exactly the same as these two. These two soldiers came in and did not move a thing. They slept, they worked there, they ate there. They never intruded on our presence. They never said much to us except to say good morning, or hi, was honest. And uh, the last thing they were going, they told Mother, um, you're not going to see us again. And Mother said, well, I hope we do. I hope we see you again. And uh, they said, no, we are going for some reason to the South Pacific uh, to fight the Americans there. And I don't think we'll see us. And uh, for some reason, that, it kept me as a haunting memory that uh, these people who were so brutal to the Chinese had this other side to us, which was very human. And I think it, was, it, uh, it brought back to me especially after I was a soldier and an occupant in Germany during the Korean War, I was in the American Army, that um, you are in a, in a separate 
just as much an isolated group as an army occupation soldier as you are as a missionary in China or any other place. You are taught by yourself. And it, it makes a difference. Uh, and uh, it was after two years in German occupation duty that I got, I had more sympathy in a way for the, for the Japanese that I had seen 20 years ago and started to realize that they had gone through, uh, that I was going through in a way, the same thing they did. So thank you. this morning have been of extraordinary intellectual quality, but I feel we need to inject a little more subjective attitude into this. Uh, Mimi referred briefly in passing to Little State Roy of the Shanghai American School, <laughs> and I want to expand on that a little, because uh, I arrived in the middle of the school year to people already having formed these friendships. I was a year younger than my classmates. I was a 13-year-old, and most of them 14-year-olds, because I had skipped the seventh grade when I attended a tiny little school outside of Pittsburgh, where the seventh and eighth grade 
were together. And the teacher discovered I seemed to know everything that the Yeda graduates were studying. And so I was a year younger when I arrived at the Shanghai American School in the middle of the school year. Now, there was a hierarchy in our class that was not based on brain power, but on beauty. And the three goddesses of the class were Mary Bell Brewster, Mary Newman, and Ann Scoble. And these were, these were people in our class that were worthy of the judgment of Paris in my fevered 13-year-old brain. So that I was always tongue-tied in the presence of these raving beauties. So Mimi's statement about Little State Roy was an understatement. I want to emphasize that it, it required the evacuation of these raving beauties before I was beginning to be able to express myself in any uh, articulate form. So thank you for reminding me of that situation because it's still very alive in my own mind. <laughs> childhood, I was never in a Chinese home. Now, the missionaries probably were much closer to the Chinese people than, than the oil people. But later, there was a Chinese student up in Maine that got me interested in going back to China. And 
when I went to Shanghai, I went to his house, his parents' house for dinner. Well, they must have spent three months' salary on that dinner. And it was an amazing thing. Three generations were there. This little charcoal stove, but what a dinner. The Shaoxing wine, everything. So I don't think I'll ever accept an uh, invitation from, from Chinese to go to their house for dinner. They're so generous that it's, it's amazing. And the adjustment to the U.S. Uh, was difficult. I went to 11 schools. I was teased as Ching Chong Chinaman and, you know, things like that. Uh, little kids don't like. I hope that's partially answered your question. Hey, Charlie. I, I have a couple of things I'd like to share. Uh, very vivid memories of Dr. Nichols' focus on this question. Uh, We learned from the we learned from the servants though we were yeah, always was, in the service. Oh, I, I, I was going to say. Oh. Uh, well, the, two, two things I want to say. One thing was uh, when we went to SAS in 2004 with Mimi and a whole bunch, 37 others, and Mimi, I, and Jeff, and I forget who the fourth, fourth person was. Two from the missionary group and two from the business community, and we're sharing our remembrance of China. And I had I had my memories of China, but it wasn't China. I was brought up in colonial England, okay? The only Chinese I ever saw were servants, you know? But, uh, and so they came and uh, him and me, me, me saying, you know, well, we all, we, we associate all our, our playmates with Chinese, you know? I had all uh, uh, Occidental playmates here while you being. And so, but I really didn't live in China, I just was at China. And, but I did speak Chinese because the servants were not allowed to speak English to me. Since you spent 95% of your time with the Chinese and uh, they spoke pidgin, you were going to be speak pidgin when you're five, six, seven, eight years old. So I had to learn local dialect Chinese. And the other thing was my parents would go out to dinner 14, 13 nights out of 14 in a two week span. And the only reason they didn't go out to 14 they and the hikies with their very good friends would have a dinner date together, which they never went to, but they gave them a night at home. So I hated to sit in a dining room with 24 chairs and have three boys with their back against the wall serving me dinner. Uh, I mean, it, it just didn't feel right, all by myself. So what I would do is tell them I wanted to eat with them. So they'd take the meat that I was going to have for dinner and would feel the whole service, all 20 of them, you know, they'd all get some meat. I got about two thirds of it back and they got the other third spread out. So it was like feast day for them. But I, uh, that, was, that was the only association I had that was, was sharing dinners with them. And we had a servant's compound and they all lived in something that looked like one car garages, you know, surrounded and the top of it had uh, bamboo and bamboo mats, you know, that was winter, summer, in the winter it kept the snow off and the rain, and the summer it kept the shade. And but those, those are my memories, but uh, we didn't live in China, but it was very different. I, I, I'm not a child of China, I'm a child of the world. Is my voice loud enough for people to hear? Yeah. Um, my experience at the Shanghai American School was that we were cut off from the Chinese community. Not because of any barriers in the way, but simply the way things function. What struck me about the Shanghai American School, here we were in the heart of the wicked city of Shanghai, uh, which has created verbs, you Shanghai somebody, uh, that had to do with the reputation of Shanghai as this great, big, uh, sophisticated city. And we, as ninth graders, could simply sign out and take a bus off down to the downtown areas and cruise around if we wanted to. So in that sense, we weren't cut off from the local city. But I had completely lost my childhood Chinese after three years in the United States when we went back to China in 1948. And at the end of my 
uh, what, half year at the Shanghai American School, and that includes several months at the Nanjing School, I had zero Chinese. It was only after my family returned to uh, uh, Nanjing, where my parents had been all along, and there we were immersed in a Chinese environment, which was much closer to my experience seven years in Chengdu, where we had close Chinese friends. In fact, the closest friends were not the other missionaries, but were, the, um, were, were Chinese colleagues. And where I learned childhood Chinese, and one of the disappointments of my diplomatic exposure in China was that we were completely cut off. And there, there were barriers put up by the Chinese side. So for example, my children couldn't learn childhood Chinese from being in China. They had to learn it at school uh, because they didn't have an opportunity to mix with the Chinese friends that I had both in Chengdu and when I went back to Nanjing after the, uh, most of the American community had been evacuated. So that I think that if I had spent my time in China attending the Shanghai American School, I would have a sense of China as an outsider. And it was our, my experiences not at the Shanghai American School that gave me a much better feel for, well, the way I put it is that the advantage of growing up in China is you don't see the Chinese as anything other than human beings. There's no romanticization of China, which occurs among some foreigners who study Chinese culture, et cetera, and everything in China becomes good. When I was a child in Chengdu, we had to be careful dealing with some of the college students, the Chinese college students, to avoid predators who would uh, try to take advantage of you, et cetera. So my experience in China is that Chinese are just like us. They're human beings. You didn't make any differentiation in terms of superiority or lack of superiority. But that attitude came from my non-Shanghai American School experience. What we got at the Shanghai American School was a first grade education so that we could easily fit back into the American educational environment. Uh, I found that there was no problem in integrating into the intellectual school system in the United States. There was some problem of having different social relationships yeah. based on the smaller communities that you had in China. And I found that socially it was much more difficult to sort of fit back into the American society. But those are just my subjective impressions. Can I say something about the Chinese school? Yeah. Uh, I just want to say very briefly, because I may be very later but uh, in this same situation, our family, during the late 30s, when I was 8, 9, 10, uh, that's the when you start really remembering things, uh, we were the only children, American children, in our town. And so all of my friends were Chinese, mostly from the mission uh, uh, community, but also we wandered the uh, town freely. And um, <coughs> uh, we were a wall city at that time still, before first the Chinese and then the Japanese leveled the wall. And we used to, I used to go out early in the morning on my bicycle and explore the city. And I, you know, talk with the rickshaw man. And I remember being outraged when uh, one rickshaw man who was eating his rice uh, offered me a bowl of rice and his friend said, oh no, no. You know, he's a foreigner, he eats bread, he doesn't eat rice. And I said, no, I don't. You know, we eat rice. <laughs> I was quite offended, really. So, in that sense, we were blended in, and yet in many other senses, we weren't. It wasn't until I came back after, well, until I came back after the separation period, that I learned that our back door opened on uh, the... Uh, home, uh, the ancestral home in the old home of Lu Xun. Now two things, one, Lu Xun was a very famous uh, writer to the Chinese, but I never heard of him until I went back. And his family home was right behind ours. We, had, we shared a canal you know, on the backside. And so in that sense, we were, I was in many ways cut off from, from Chinese culture. Partly, perhaps, because my father, a doctor, without a lot of uh, 
sort of political, uh, he, he was, was non-political in many ways. And so there wasn't a lot of conversation or discussion about Chinese politics. We knew things were going on. But the other thing I was going to say is that I grew up in, in China where we had a lot of wars, but we weren't, you know, the family attitude is illustrated by uh, when we came back from furlough in 1937, people said, hey, there's a war out there. And the, my folks sort of shrugged and said, well, there's always wars in China. And it was always amazed to me that the extent to which the mission families would send their kids right off, in your case, to, you went alone, I believe, to SAS, yeah? Uh, I traveled from Nanjing to Shanghai alone as alone. a 13 year old. Yeah, and That's there were, there's many cases like that. So the missionaries apparently developed an attitude that was, you know, this is our job, our job first. We're, Maybe I'll say it now, but Carl and I, I have, one reason I feel so close to Carl is because our two families seem very parallel in their experiences, except for a few important ways. And, uh, uh, but his father and my father were classmates in, in, in Beijing language school. Uh, they had six kids, we had six kids. Uh, we met again on the grips home when there was half the family was away and half not. Uh, so we had those kinds of parallels, and Carl's already said for me, if I, you know, I could say, if you want to know what the experience is like, it's mostly like what Carl said. Later on, if you want to hear about it, I'll be happy to talk about the key difference uh, we had. Uh, we were very, we, we went a very different path in our relationships with the Japanese. And I think I've discovered to my amazement as I got to know Carl better and better, first at SAS and then in the years since, how different the perspective of your, the impact of the war on you makes on your attitude and feelings about China. So I think we were comfortable, most comfortable being among Chinese because we grew up among Chinese, and those were the faces. And I have married an Indonesian lady with Chinese ancestry as well as many others. And my brother married a Chinese uh, student. And I can't help feeling that that wasn't accidental. That, that uh, your notions of uh, the world were much more integrated and also being in China American school. There we were very American, but that was, you know, I was delighted the first time I went to concentration camp because it was the first time I had played with any American kids in years. <laughs> so this, this mix is, is a part, a very much a part of our experience and it's different for each of us. I think we'll make this the last response before we break for lunch. Um, well, I'm Harry Lewis, and I only was at SAS for six months. Uh, I grew up in North China and, uh, and went to Peking American School and was very active for a long time with the PAS Association, which is already pretty much stopped. But uh, we, PAS was not a boarding school, and it basically was missionary kids with some Chinese kids and military uh, brats in the school. Um, I, to answer the lady's question, uh, the one thing I experienced, I didn't speak Shanghai Hua, but I know some of my friends at SAS did, and I can remember being squeezed into buses and one of my friends would let, let out a string of profanity in Chinese, and these Chinese people would look at us, little American kids, swearing like any Chinese could. I couldn't do that. But uh, and then we also had experiences where we would go off at night and down to the Bund, which isn't the same Bund it is now. And uh, my parents finding out about that later were very upset, but it was fine. We got one fine, no problems. Um, two things. Uh, my experience in, um, at SAS was back a, a little bit of America, because in Peking, we were really much more absorbed in the Chinese culture. Um, <coughs> popular music, 
Glenn Miller, all of those things. It was a very interesting experience. My dad um, worked with the medical uh, material there. My mother taught school, but my sister Cecil was in the ninth grade. My, my brother Charles was in the sixth grade. My Wendy, was, the littlest sister, was, I, I don't know what grade she was in. Um, so that's my connection. It's the first time I've been to a, a SAS meeting because uh, I'm living on the West Coast and I'm not as involved. I haven't been as, as involved. The other thing I wanted to mention was the fact that at, uh, in 41, my mother and four of us kids went home in May when the mission board told us that the women and children should leave. And my dad was interned very similar to the situation with the scolds. He was home, a uh, prisoner in his own home uh, for a while, and then he was at Wei Xian. And it's interesting, uh, Eric Little was also in the same dorm with him. And he died, I, I believe he died before they went home the second time. My dad came back on the group zone with the scolds and with Ted. Um, uh, he was a doctor. But uh, interestingly, you know that the Chinese government has made a um, memorial of Eric Little at Weishen. And uh, there's a movie that just, they made, the Chinese government just made, called The Last Race, which is about Eric Little and his life as a missionary in China. It has been made, but it has not been distributed in the United States. And I keep hoping to find out that they're going to show it in the theaters here. But so far, I haven't seen it advertised anywhere, but it is a movie that has been made and 